Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Allison Cardona, California State Director for the UC Davis Correct Shelter Med Medicine Program. Welcome to the Monday Maddie's Call. So great to see everyone. Please feel free as you're coming in, if you're new to this call, to introduce yourself in the chat where you're from. You can see Laura there um, from good acronym, MAMAS, um, and Lucy from Indiana. We love to hear um, new folks joining the call and appreciate that people are spreading the word about this important resource. And we have an exciting call today, but first the question of the day is what are you as an organization doing to get ready for July 4th or July 1st if you're in Canada? And this could be what you're doing to prepare animals, your community, your staff, your volunteers. And if we could get two people to unmute and share what they're doing, that would be great. And you can also put your answers in the chat. Emily, free microchips for the community. Amazing. Free microchips. I'm wondering if you also, are they automatically registered or do folks have to register them themselves? The question is, what is your organization doing to get ready for the July 4th uh, holiday in terms of lots of firework, for fireworks, intakes, things like that? Um, and it can be things that you're doing for the animals, for your community, and for your staff and volunteers. Yeah, and would love to get um, someone to unmute and share what they're doing. And it can be anything small or as big. I can share a little bit about what we're doing if you'd like. Please. So we are offering walk-in microchipping services. Um, so as long as we're open, people can come in and uh, get a microchip. Um, we also purchased off of Amazon some small, um, very inexpensive um, dual frequency microchip readers that we are going to chain to the outside of the building with instructions on, because we're closed on the 4th of July, uh, with instructions on how to use the microchip scanner and what to do if there's a number there so people can get those animals returned to their homes um, without having to have the shelter, a vet clinic at any hours of the day and night um, to be able to try and get those animals home without actually having to come come here. I love that. Way to involve the community and make it really accessible. So that's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Let's get one more person to share. If you can share something that you're doing. And even if it sounds like some folks have some barriers, um, but maybe we can help try to remove those. But one more person to share. This is an FYI, Miguel is in the house, as is Jothi. Thank you. All ready for that. And don't forget the uh, announcement about next week's meeting. I think yes. we should repeat that because more people are now on the call. Sure, no problem. We're just, once we get, um, we'd just love to hear one more thing, or even the person who said they're having a barrier, if you don't mind sharing about your um, State Department of Ag. Um, that's me. I'm in North Carolina. Um, I will <laughs> put it this way. I won't share my name of my county <laughs> to protect the guilty. Um, no, we, um, you know, it's a state regulation that shelters are not allowed to practice veterinary medicine unless we are licensed as a veterinary hospital, which we're not. So we are not allowed to um, place microchips in owned animals. Um, we can only microchip those animals we legally own. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of a barrier because obviously we would like for people to be able to just come here and get that um, and not have to pay the price that might be charged by a private practice veterinarian, but we do not have a workaround on that at this time. Thanks for sharing that, Elaine. Sorry to hear that. And I'd love to hear if in the chat if folks have suggestions. Something that was recommended recently 
you can't do microchipping are something called Jiffy tags, where you can just write um, and it's a, a tag that you can put on a collar. Um, so just trying to think of alternatives in the meantime. And yes, Allison Gibson was mentioning, just a reminder that we will not be having a call next week for the holiday. Uh, so July 3rd, no call, but Allison just posted in the chat some links to some suggested uh, past community conversations. Feel free to check those out. So uh, important and incredible. And next we'll have uh, national updates. Anyone who'd like to either post in the chat or you can also unmute. Hi, Hello, everybody. Oh, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll be quick. I just wanted to give a reminder that we are welcoming proposals to speak at Animal Care Expo 2024 through the Humane Society of the United States. Um, we welcome those proposals through Monday, July 31st, and I'm happy to place the link in the chat as well. I will join Jennifer in saying that Humane Canada is also uh, welcoming abstracts for the Summit for Animals 2024, which will be held in beautiful Halifax, Nova Scotia. So we're on the East Coast this year, or next year rather. And I note that my friend and colleague from the Saskatchewan SPCA, Laura's Mudd, has put something in the chat with respect to two free webinars that they're offering, one of which is Pride in Animal Welfare on the 27th, and then um, also on the 29th, Indigenous History and Animal Welfare. So she's got the link in the chat for you to sign up to one or both of those. Hi everyone, Sheila Sigerson from Maddie's Fund. Just letting everyone know that our next behavior job alike meeting is this Thursday at 9, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And we'll be hearing from Kim Ifford, who's going to be talking about teaching volunteers simple and easy ways to observe and communicate about body language. And we'll also be hearing from Steve Porter of Shelter Buddy to get an overview of behavior functionality in Shelter Buddy software. Thank you. Excellent. Any other national updates? I've got a quick one, uh, Allison. So, hey everyone, Charlotte from Maddie's Fund. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat, but the team that handles the programming for these weekly community conversations calls, uh, we'd love your feedback. We've got a short survey. It'll just allow us to learn more about what type of topics and things you all want us to discuss on these calls, um, and then also finding speakers for future calls. So I'll drop the link in the chat and we'd love to hear what you think. Thank you. Great, last call. Any other national updates? Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jothi Robertson now, who has an exciting update on a new course that's available. Thank you, Allison. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jothi Robertson, and I'm a shelter medicine vet. I've been practicing in uh, shelter since 2005 and have been working mostly in organizations. And we'll start lavender their court toward Windsor Lane, then turn left. <laughs> yes. And so I, I mostly have been doing shelter, shelter work and um, helping as a shelter consultant doing organizational design, things like that. And a couple years ago, I started a new nonprofit project called The Journey You Own. And um, just this past year, I have been working on a module with Maddie's Fund that we're launching today, and I'd love to be able to share my screen just for a minute to tell you a little bit about it. I am going to just hop into here. It's just a couple slides. So this is a free module that's available on Maddie's University for anyone who's interested it's really meant to support individuals and teams, uh, their emotional, mental well being of, of individuals. So, uh, when you go to it, you'll see that there's 
in Maddie's University, there's an overview and then there's contents, recordings, community section. So in the content section, when you view the course, you'll see that there's uh, really five different sections for this class. And we've designed it in such a way that it's a choose your own adventure. It's really dependent on what it is you're interested in specifically. So there's um, sections on productivity, on contemplative practices, on communication and so on. And when you um, go into that, you can also download an activity book that kind of supports all of these sections. And additionally, what's really fun about this module is that um, we also have some live Zoom sessions that we'll be doing. So there's five of them, one for each section, but staff or anybody can join any of them, even without having done a particular section. And those will dive more deeply into each of these topics. So these are topics that I've noticed seem to be really, uh, you know, they're, they're topics that we haven't really talked about, I feel, in our field, and yet they will really support our uh, individual teams, our, our staff, our, ourselves, in being able to do the work that, that we want to be doing, you know, to, to make ourselves feel more whole, complete, fulfilled in our work. They're introductory topics though, which is why these um, individual Zoom sessions can dive a little bit more deeply into everything. And those will be recorded. The other area when you're on this uh, community page, you'll see there's a community forum area that I would love to have you all join. If you take the course, it's an opportunity to have more discussion around all these topics. And it helps our team know any areas that we can expand upon to be able to support all of you. And so again, um, this is a Maddie's Fund based uh, module. It's, it's free um, for anyone on your team. So it's something you can offer through your you know, HR department to be able to support individuals. It's, it's really meant to explore different areas of emotional and mental well being. And I just want to say a special shout out thank you to my team because I didn't create this on my own. It was really uh, Jasmine Johnson, Robin Vincent, Lisa Ramalana, Ross Mock, and myself that put it together. And it would not look as amazing as it is if it hadn't been for Erica Schaefer. Erica is um, sort of the brains and technology person behind um, Maddie's University's modules. And, and I just really wanna thank her and then also thank Charlotte Otero for uh, all the work that she put into the Maddie's Forum and, and setting up this whole community page. So again, this is just a, a free offering. Uh, you can take it, you can do sections of it, you can just download the activity book, you can just come to the Zoom sessions, whatever you may find helpful or that your teams might find helpful. Thank you. Allison, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Robertson. How beautiful. I can't wait to take this course. And thank you for all you're doing for our community and our well-being. And now we're going to go to our presentation. I have to admit, I'm fangirling hard here to in, be able to introduce Miguel Ordeñana. Um, anyone who lives in the Los Angeles area, you know, Miguel and the discovery he made of P22, it's just, it's our own personal celebrity. Um, so it's just really, I'm thrilled that he's here to share his expertise and story with us. And he is an environmental educator and wildlife biologist who works at the Natural Museum Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County as a senior manager in the community science office. And in that role, he promotes and creates community science projects and recruits and trains participants. He uses his mammal research background by conducting urban mammal research in LA and leads the museum's Southern California Squirrel, Squirrel Survey and Backyard Bat Survey. He also serves as an advisor on a Jaguar project in Southwestern Nicaragua that he initiated in 2012, as well as a board member for the Friends of Griffith Park and National Wildlife Federation. Miguel's dedicated 
towards making science and access to nature more equitable with a goal of increasing the representation and retention of underrepresented communities within the environmental field. He holds a bachelor's, bachelor's degree in environmental studies from USC and an MS in ecology from UC Davis. It is really my honor to introduce Miguel, who will be sharing his experience with us. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to, to be with you all. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, let's see here. Okay. There we go. All right, can y'all see that okay? Yes. So, all right, thank you. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I am gonna be talking about um, P22, um, my kind of how my story intersects with his and the legacy that he's kind of left behind, um, but also kind of how he's influenced uh, my career um, and just me as a person, as an individual, and hopefully, uh, what I share it resonates with a lot of you all and um, hopefully helps you all find um, more connection to urban wildlife and or just nature in general uh, in a way that's that's relevant to excuse me relevant to you. Um, to give you some background, I want to definitely um, give you a sense of kind of where I'm coming from as an individual. I grew up in the city of Los Angeles. Um, my mom. Uh, moved there when I was very young after she, after she split with my dad. And so um, she uh, found an apartment um, near Griffith Park. And Griffith Park is one of the biggest urban open spaces in, in the country. A uh, very unique place. Um, but even though I grew up really close to the park that you see here in the foreground, um, the message that I got or the narrative that I was hearing as a child was that once the concrete begins, nature's, nature ends. And if you're in the city, it's devoid of nature, or at least any nature worth caring about. Um, and so that was kind of a difficult kind of setting to be in, especially when, um, even though I had a very nurturing, loving mom who you see here in the middle, um, if I'm told that on a regular basis and people like me are told that on a regular basis, it's hard to find a connection to nature. And that was, my case, I had this passion for wildlife from reading zoo books or uh, seeing animals on TV. But um, my mom and my family didn't talk about science. They didn't talk about nature. I wasn't in Boy Scouts. I didn't go bird watching uh, with my friends or my family. We used Griffith Park to just get some fresh air and exercise. My mom taught me how to play catch there. Uh, we'd have barbecues, um, but not really um, anything out there or any resources. Friends of Griffith Park wasn't around at the time to really make that connection, to show people that this isn't just a place for recreation, which is a really valid way to use open space, but it's also a really thriving ecosystem. Um, and there's so much to explore and learn that I just didn't know about. And my mom put me in a... a, a weekend program and as a high as a high school student I wasn't a very good student and so she's like hey you gotta do something and and kind of fill that uh void in, in in your kind of motivation basically and uh and so she was really worried that I wouldn't be kind of ready for college so she put me in this program at the zoo where I learned zoology uh, about the animals on exhibit and um, and it was really impactful for me um, and really built up my confidence to talk about wildlife, to feel like I could be a college student, to feel like I could pursue a career in conservation maybe someday. So again, without my mom, I don't know definitely where I'd be today. But the biggest impact that I had um, were these accidental, that really kept me motivated, were these accidental encounters with wildlife. Um, like I said, I lived not too far from this park that was core habitat for with for some amazing species like coyotes and bobcats that I learned as an adult um, 
and deer that I didn't know lived in the park, um, different species of squirrels that I didn't know lived in the park. Anyway, sometimes they come into our neighborhood to go foraging or even den in vacant lots. And them dashing across our car um, in all, all of a sudden um, and spooking us, yeah, those are memorable experiences that, that gave me that unexpected connection to nature, it made me curious about how these animals survive and these animals that I only see depicted in places like Yellowstone, how are they surviving here in the city? Nobody was really talking about that at the time. And so that was enough to kind of keep me going. And still, though, I was I was really not told that, hey, there's really a career and opportunity to study wildlife in the city. So I went to Africa in college and studied um, for a few months out there to get my field research experience because I didn't think that was a possibility in the city. And so that was an amazing experience. I learned a lot, learned field research, worked with um the Maasai tribe a lot, um, talking, learning about human wildlife conflict. And so it really brought, I took a lot, I learned a lot of lessons that I took back with me, which were really helpful. Fast forward, um, I'm a early career professional. Um, one of my first jobs was with the US Geological Survey studying bobcats in Irvine, California of all places. And this was an, an inspiring moment for me because um, like I said, I didn't know what a bobcat was as a kid. I didn't know that they existed right under my nose throughout my childhood. Um, and it was embarrassing for me to, to not have known that. And all these other people that I was working with, like, oh, you didn't know bobcats lived in Southern California? And <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, it was great to know that, that these animals were um, not as adaptable as coyotes, but adaptable enough to survive in the city. So there's so much that I learned in that process, but also gave me a fire in my belly to really not only do this research, but do it in a way that connects people that are historically um, underserved um, by the environmental field, as far as environmental education um, or inclusion within the conservation movement. And I think that that moment was, was one of those pivotal moments for me that really kind of, um, put me on this path to not only do field research and uh, traditional um, wildlife conservation work, but also um, making sure that I do it in a way that's relatable to general audience, uh, excuse me, um, all audiences of all backgrounds. My expertise uh, in grad school um, that I kind of um, really kind of focused on was being a carnivore biologist. That was what I learned, that's what I focus on. Urban carnivores were my connection to nature and I really wanted to learn more and, and pursue a career in that. And so uh, because I have the expertise, I ended up having the opportunity to help start a project in Nicaragua with a nonprofit called Paso Pacifico in the Southwestern section of um, Nicaragua, figuring out if there's a population there. Uh, it was thought to be extinct for about 30 years, but um, but there were signs that were jaguars there. And I went out there to confirm that and then work with the community members to see, hey, how can we coexist with these animals given that there's ranching in the area? And this, this perception of jaguars that as they're dangerous or, um, or a risk, to, or excuse me, or a threat to their livelihoods. And so is it not of, community engagement um, of people, not only adults that own those properties, because it's mostly all private property, but also um, children, the next generation who will own these and inherit these properties. And hopefully um, by that, by the time they're adults, there's this paradigm shift so that it's more welcoming to, to Jaguars and this idea of coexistence in general. And here's a couple of those Jaguars that we got. Um, these are brothers and that that we're um eating quite a bit of uh horses and 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 cattle and so it was a lot of work kind of convincing this community to say hey um let's kind of figure out a way to make sure that your livelihood continues to thrive but also that these jaguars are able to survive um and so that was a that was a really interesting and great great moment and now the community out there runs this project they continue the jaguar monitoring which is kind of the ideal situation where that the community that 
has to live and coexist with these animals really take ownership of this work, not someone from the outside. Even though I'm Nicaraguan American, very proud to be that, um, those are the community members that should be running this project. Um, so, but my most meaningful project I've ever done um, was the opportunity when I came back to LA and start a project in Griffith Park. Griffith Park um, is a beautiful open space. And unless you are kind of really knowledgeable about nature and, and e urban ecosystems, people write it off. People see it as this isolated um, park that's for tourism and, and filming and, and maybe yeah, some hiking, but really not a really important place for, for wildlife. Um, fortunately, Friends of Griffith Park was was really getting going at that point and really putting the word out about what was out there and doing surveys. And I wanted to do a connectivity survey now that I was back in Los Angeles and use my expertise to support that idea that this is an ecosystem that's not only valuable to wildlife that live there, but to potentially wildlife in neighboring open spaces that are wide ranging, like deer, coyotes, bobcats. And so we put cameras on these potential corridors that connected the park to neighboring open spaces, whether they were bridges that went over the 101 freeway or equestrian tunnels that went underneath freeways towards the LA River and beyond. Um, and as you can see, we got our answer to our question, which was, is Griffith Park an island? That was, it was pretty simple. And obviously not. These deer are going back and forth using this bridge. It's not ideal, obviously, because uh, they're sharing this bridge with cars, but it's better than going over the 10 lane 101 freeway that's right below that. The biggest discovery and moment of that project was of course, uh, discovering P22. Um, this was a moment that I'll never forget. Uh, I was sitting on a swivel chair, just like I am now. And when I saw this photo, I literally almost fell off my chair. Um, and and it immediately started like reaching for my phone, couldn't find it, and ran full speed barefoot to my car two blocks away to, to grab my phone and call somebody. Um, it was like, yeah, seeing Bigfoot. It was one of those Bigfoot moments where you, people say, hey, there's pr probably never going to be a mountain lion there, but some people would send photos of their cat or their dog and say, hey, I found a mountain lion in Griffith Park. And so it was that type of kind of myth. And so to get this photo that was undeniable was just an amazing, amazing moment. And the next question was, where did it come from? How did it get there? How are people gonna ex accept this animal into this ecosystem? And yet at the same time, like for me personally, I was like, oh my God, I didn't know this was be ever be possible. Scientists that I work closely with that study mountain lions we're like, this is never, ha this is never going to happen. Cause I would ask occasionally like, Hey, do you think a mountain lion will ever make it to Griffith park? Cause it's part of the Santa Monica mountains where there are mountain lions further, further East, excuse me, further West. Um, and so the idea was no, because it was too isolated. There's too many, too much urbanization between Griffith park and neighboring open spaces that had mountain lions. But um, as soon as it was cap, this individual was captured, um, blood was taken to match it with um, other mountain lion populations and to see where it was linked to. And they actually, because the Park Service had been studying mountain lions since 2002, um, they had a lot of mountain lions they had studied up to that point and their genetics. And so he was actually linked to um, the very first mountain lion ever studied in the Santa Monica Mountains, which is P1, Puma 1. Puma, P stands for Puma and the number. Um, refers to the sequence and order that animal was captured and studied. Um, and so P-22 was a 22nd puma incorporated in the Park Service study once he was captured and tagged. Um, so, but the what that says is that because P-1, his dad, was lived his whole life west of the 405, that meant that P-22 had to cross the 405, had to go through a bunch of urbanization, like Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Studio City, that's in between the 405 and the 101. And then cut across the 101 freeway, another um, massive barrier to get in the park. And that's what the 101 looks like. That was his last crossing that he had to make to get into Griffith Park, which is on the right side. Pretty amazing. And then he was ca captured, collared, and the collar, um, tells you a lot of information. Uh, I don't know if you can see my little thumbnail nail here. This is what the collar looks like. Um, 
And there's a battery on the bottom here that lasts about two years. And then the GPS transmitter on the top that tells the, the biologist where he's at about eight times a day. And what's interesting about that shows you how he's using the landscape, what part of the landscape he's using, and also what he's eating. Because if he repeats a location night after night, that means he's on a kill, which is mostly usually a, a deer. His primary source of prey is deer, 87% deer, and the rest is raccoons and coyotes, um, about the rest of the 13%. Um, and so um, that was really cool um, to really see that he was eating just the same, had the same diet as animals, individuals that were in much rural open spaces in California, in Southern California. He wasn't changing his diet to all of a sudden go after chihuahuas and, and cats because he's in this urban setting. He's still eating deer. And it also says a lot of, about Griffith Park, the fact that there is a reproductive population of deer or enough connectivity for deer to come in and out for him to be able to eat about a deer a week. Um, so for 10 years, basically. Um, so yeah, so I just wanna show you a glimpse of kind of how it works. If you're not familiar with mountain lion behavior, they cache their food just like squirrels. So right in front of them is a deer, um, which that's a mule deer if you haven't, you're not familiar, not from the area. Um, and there's a deer right in front of him there. He covers it with leaf litter, just like a squirrel would hide its acorns under leaf litter. And he'd pull it out the next evening when he's ready to feed on it some more. Um, groom himself, just like your house cat would. Cough up a hairball, just like your house cat would. And uh, that would that's it. And he became a very famous mountain lion after G National Geographic took this iconic photo of him. And that really kind of, Shared, got his share, story out there to the world about that LA is not just this place for movies, uh, excuse me, movie stars, traffic, smog. It's also a place for wild, wildlife and nature. Um, and having the Hollywood sign there in the background really, really kind of sends a statement, which is that cities are not off the hook when it comes to urban wildlife conservation. And we have one of two directions to go. We can either push these animals to extinction or make this area more hospitable to them. And I'm glad kind of at least LA is going in the right direction um, regarding kind of um, holding themselves accountable to what's in front of them. Um, and just to, to give people a sense of pride and, and, and also their own fire under their belly to say that, hey, other than Mumbai, India, who have leopards bordering their cities and sometimes going inside their cities, LA is that only other place in the world that has large cats living within their city limits. And so let's kind of keep that status going um, before it's too late. And to give you more perspective, how amazing his story is, his dad's territory is 200 square miles, which is that blue polygon you see there to the left. That's 200 square miles. That's usually the size of a normal mountain lion territory. And P-22's territory is that little green polygon to the right. So you can imagine um, how um, like, um, surprised people were that he was able to survive there for so long and coexist with people. And sometimes that means to get from one side of the park to the other, you have to cross through someone's front, front porch. Um, and he did that multiple times without incident. Um, or he gets spooked by somebody's headlights and jump over a 10 foot fence like you'll see here. Um, that, that is just something that was part of his life, unfortunately, um, but he survived 10 years kind of dealing with that. But most of his time was in these natural, really wild parts. And that's kind of part of his success. Uh, you see, I saw that hawk feeding on his kill there and here he is kind of taking it back. Um, but, that's an, that speaks to another part of now the hawk's not happy because the, the deer is gone. Um, See, so yeah, kind of looking for it. Um, but um, he also would eat raccoons. And so basically that first section that I saw, those foot, first set of footage of the deer carcass is to show you that he has this other role in the ecosystem, right? He's not only a top predator that kind of keeps maybe deer populations in check to some extent, but he's also um, leaves a lot of food behind. So a lot of animals like hawks, raccoons, other scavengers, 
even detrivores um, after that animals decompose in the soil are benefiting from him being out there and killing animals and, and leaving things behind. Pumas, unlike other big cats, or large cat, excuse me, he's not a big cat uh, technically, um, get spooked pretty easily by other animals, whether it's coyotes and other parts of the range, it's wolves and bears. So a lot of times they'll leave a lot of that food behind. But him reading a eating a raccoon um, says another thing, right? If you're doing that in an urban ecosystem where people put rat poison out, it's dangerous. And he, that danger caught up with him eventually where he got very, very, very sick. He nearly died um, from exposure to first-generation anticoagulants, which is the less lethal version of anticoagulants. Um, he died, almost died because... Um, that poison was kind of really affecting his immune system to the point where he couldn't fight off other naturally occurring diseases like mange, uh, which is always in the ecosystem and usually animals can fight it off. But if your immune system is compromised by poison and multiple exposures to poison um, by eating raccoons or, or rabbits, rats that have that, that in their system, then, then you're in trouble um, if you accumulate that. Um, and another story was that he went into the LA Zoo and took out a, a, a koala. Um, people thought maybe he thought it was a raccoon because this is an elderly koala that liked to walk on the ground a lot. Um, so people were, were thinking that was what happened. And, and um, it was great to see that, that people stood up for P22 because a lot of times if something like that happens, people can issue a permit to have them removed. And so fortunately, the zoo did not take that um, take that direction, and um, they kind of gave him a pass. Um, he also got stu stuck under a house for, for um, quite a while, and the media found out and surrounded the house with media helicopters, they did live interviews in the, in the crawl space. Um, oops, sorry, I went too fast there. Um, and it was a really tough situation because um people started cornering him under this this uh this house and he could have lashed out which would have really sent the wrong message to people about how to coexist with with mountain lions and um and also what mountain lions are like if they only think about him as this kind of animal that that lashed out after he was cornered that sends kind of ruins their reputation as you can imagine and so but nonetheless, he kept his cool. He didn't do anything even after they were shooting tennis ball guns at him and and uh, just waited for these people to tire themselves out. And then he left without anybody seeing him, even with media helicopters and vans still surrounding the property. Nobody saw him leave. And here is during the pandemic, he walked right in front of my, <laughs> my friend's house. Um, and uh, walked right in front of their, her, her French doors. And what's, this says a lot, right? She obviously could have alerted the authorities and freaked out about it. But instead, well, she was obviously scared and startled. But then she called me and was like, I made this new video and I created animation. I did slow-mo and I'm going to share it with all my friends instead of seeing it as this negative experience is this really proud moment for her, which is pretty cool. Um, and then now there's an exhibit in the Naturalist Museum of LA County that I helped uh, create, um, which brings in a lot of kids of all backgrounds and ages and families to learn about his story and learn about a story that's really tangible. Not only learning about African animals in our other halls and places where other animals exist in the world that are really awesome and deserve conservation attention, but to let people know that there's animals right here, right under our nose that need our attention as well. There's a population of mountain lions that's almost going extinct here in Southern California that need our attention and we should take pride in that effort. And, um, and that what's great about it is that as he became more famous, people of all backgrounds that have been historically excluded from conversations about wildlife and, and nature are now interpreting the story in their own way, sharing it with their own communities in a way that's relevant to them so that his story has even bigger impact. So being translated into Spanish, um, talk 
turn into indigenous storytelling opportunities, um, mar marionettes, documentaries, um, all uh, children's books, festivals that attracted 15,000 people last year. Um, amazing stuff and dated himself in the city. But as his hair, he got to be, get, he got older, his health started to decline and um, he started going into cities more often. And unfortunately, um, one of those trips um, in December of last year, he got hit by a car and, and kind of, that was, that was kind of the beginning of the end for him, unfortunately. And um, our museum became one of many memorial spaces for him, for people can kind of grieve together and, and share their own thoughts about what he meant to them and how they're gonna honor his legacy um, by protecting urban open spaces or uh, advocating for connectivity, advocating for the mountain lion population, advocating for the banning of rat poisons. Um, there's a lot of different ways people were saying that that they want to honor his legacy. Um, and also it really sparked some really important conversations that were long overdue with indigenous communities about them being able to share what these animals mean to them, that they don't only see them as special animals that are worth conservation attention, but they see them as ancestors. And how we deal with their management and their conservation and even what we do when they pass away, um, really kind of requires a more inclusive process. And we learned that through um, P22's passing and they use this as an opportunity to, to share that. And I'm really glad that that was another part of P22's legacy. And now we're continuing those conversations uh, to this day with these indigenous communities. And a obvious huge part of his legacy was inspiring the, the, the um, excuse me, the fundraising for a wildlife crossing that will be built in 2025. It'll be the largest wildlife crossing ever built, uh, spanning 10 lanes of traffic, and um, was, was only possible because this campaign, the Save LA Cougars campaign, used P22 as that ambassador, as that catalyst. Um, and so people knew about this idea for many, many years before P22 was around, but they could never get any momentum but P22 really got them to where they needed to be April, the year before he passed away. And, um, and so they grew up, broke ground in April uh, of that year and, and hopefully it'll be built in 2025. And we'll save not only this mountain lion population from extinction um, by, by really kind of diversifying the genetic pool there um, and allowing these animals to more safely cross um, this 101 freeway, but also other animals that have connectivity needs from birds, salamanders, um, bats, um, bobcats, coyotes, et cetera, will also benefit from this connectivity, um, this, this linkage, excuse me. But the story is not potentially over. I, there's a mountain lion that crossed over the 405 in about 2015, that's still within the, between the 405 and the 101. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen next, um, as you can, to give you an idea, if you're not from the area, crossing the 405, he's in this kind of fancy Beverly Hills, Bel Air area, and then P22 took that extra step to go over the 101. So that's how he got into Griffith Park. So this unnamed mountain lion only has to cross the 101, and he's in Griffith Park. And here he is chasing a deer through a Bel Air property. You'll see it going across the screen on the top there. Um, that is his life right now and for the past few years and he's been surviving doing that for many many years and it's it's pretty interesting to, to think about another mountain lion getting into griffith park after following him for 10 years and being fortunate enough to to photograph him and and build this uh one-way relationship <laughs> that i had uh where he doesn't know who i am at all but um there have been moments where he's watched me um check my cameras because you would walk in front of my camera just minutes after I was gone in remote canyons. And so um, he's really become a symbol of coexistence and um, and he's inspired me as a professional. And I know we have limited time here, but um, I'll quickly talk about how um, he, he inspired me to look deeper within LA's urban core and be more inclusive about 
the way that I do conservation work through community science. And I'll talk quickly about a bat project now that um, that I started in LA. Um, we use microphones to, to grab the species specific echolocations of bats that bats use to navigate in darkness, communicate um, and feed um, by hunting moths using echolocation and other flying nocturnal insects. And that's how it works. You, they have these really unique um, um, call patterns and each species has um, its own. And so that's how you identify what species are living where. This is a species that was thought to be extinct from LA for 10 years before you put these microphones out and gave these parks a chance, um, these animals a chance to be discovered, uh, rediscovered, excuse me. Um, so that's the Western Mastiff bat, the biggest bat in North America has a wingspan of almost two feet. And now we know it's it's here in LA because we're doing this work in partnership with families and community members. Covered over hundred sites in the past few years, um, documented 15 species of bats within urban neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Um, there's now five, there's, this is, there's only four here, but there's five species of special concern to recorded here in, in urban neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Some of these species were thought to only live in Northern California, or Orange County, um, and, and now we're documenting thanks to, to the help of community scientists. And um, big brown bats, we thought would be very common, and they're not. Um, all those X's are places where we surveyed for them and we could not find them. Uh, Mexican free tail bats, on their hand, are everywhere. And parks, urban parks, are acting as oases for bats, even though a lot of these neighborhoods are park poor, they, they really count. Um, having water sources, any tree cover, it's really benefiting these bats. Um, and this is the Hollywood Reservoir. And, and that's my daughter holding one of my microphones as I set it up. And then here's one um, in the middle of East La Northeast Los Angeles um, and near El Sereno um, and documented the long-legged myotis, what we didn't think was around. Um, and that's what the echolocation looks like. Uh, big free tail bat was, was documented in the South Bay of, of Los Angeles. Um, just this past year after surveying for a three year, four years. Now we're bringing people out to roost to count bats. Families uh, really enjoyed this experience, seeing bats, not just learning about them through sonograms, um, but actually counting bats with us. Um, it prepares us for the potential of disease outbreaks. If, if they come out, we, if we know their roosting behavior, where they're roosting, if they're hibernating, uh, we can better hopefully manage for white nose syndrome if it ever reaches this area. Um, also allows us to know what structure these animals are relying upon to survive in the middle of the city. And also tell us how LA compares to other parts of the country, how bats are moving on a seasonal basis um, and, and uh, migrating, et cetera. Allows us to work with new communities that, that, find, that use bats as their connection to nature and create internship programs for, for individuals underrepresented, underrepresented in the sciences. We've, we've documented a lot of roosts, counted a lot of bats, which is good from a scientific standpoint. But at the end of the day, um, it's about not only uh, prioritizing uh, excuse me, research and scientific exploration and filling in data gaps, but it's also making sure that we're bringing the community along with us um, as we do that, because these are the people that have to coexist with them. We can collect all the data we want, but if people don't know about these animals or don't care about them, then it's really not worth it, in my opinion. Um, and so here's a really great example that will be etched in your brain forever, I think, of what the power of community science and getting the community involved and getting them to trust you and earning their trust. This community member let us know about a roost that's right in front of you, believe it or not, behind this tow-away sign in this strip mall. There's a bat wedged behind that tow-away sign. And if you don't believe me, here's... Here's it flying into the to its roost, and there's four more back there. Um, and without this community member letting us know and trusting us with that information, we wouldn't know of this roost. And so um, I'll end with this, is that as we get kind of um, more comfortable looking for nature in the city, people are more aware of nature, and this technology that I use, acoustic technology, um, becomes more affordable and accessible. Um, there'll be stadium full of people that will be expecting to find bats. And at halftime of a football game, they'll be looking for bats with me instead of 
looking at me as, as, as if I'm some weirdo standing up in the middle of a game for no reason. Um, right there, it's the middle of a game, not halftime yet. And I noticed bats were flying around. Of course, because I'm a bat nerd, I had a bat detector in my pocket and uh, stood up immediately as I started seeing bats hunting moths around the stadium lights. And with this device, I was able to record Mexican free tail bats flying around uh, the stadium. Uh, but again, um, as people are more aware of it and think of cities as ecosystems and not separate from ecosystems, uh, we will be in a better place, not just as conservationists, but these animals that we coexist with will be in a better place. And um, that's something that I want for the future generations. Um, and I hope you all will uh, support that effort as well. So thank you and I'll, I'll end there. Miguel, thank you so much. The chat is alive. So many comments and questions. Um, we're going to get to those in the Maddie's Pet Forum. I did want to give my colleague Irene Chansawong an opportunity to ask a question, but thank you so, so much. Irene. Thanks, Allison. And yes, thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, you touched on the importance of inclusion in the conservation movement. And so this audience is definitely interested in interactions of um, between domestic and wild animals, uh, deterrence of wildlife other than using rod rodenticide, for example. But um, just wondering if you can share some of the programs that you have or have been done at the Natural History Museum um, for this audience, perhaps maybe to engage youth in animal caretaking? Yeah, I mean, be, the Natural History Museum is a research institution, so we don't do very much uh, wildlife management. We do have a live animal program. We have animal ambassadors and we have uh, keepers that that manage those, those animals that range from snakes to opossums to uh, an uh, ambassador owl that only has one eye. Um, and they awfully, definitely often use their, their platform and their role to talk about um, safe and, and responsible caretaking of, of animals and why the animals that we have do not make good pets, should never be pets, and, um, and why they, they belong in the wild. And some of these animals are not from the area and could and were dumped in in our in our ponds and ecosystems and why those animals um, aren't good for the ecosystem and don't belong here um, and why responsible pet management is sometimes um, not supporting the the business of of, of purchasing certain pets certain species um, and also what to do when you really can't manage your pet anymore. What's the safe and responsible thing to do? Um, so definitely there is that that side, but um, what we do in the community science office is more talk about how to um, support native wildlife, whether it's how you manage your, your um, garden, if you have a garden, um, what type of um, tree, tra tree trimming schedule you recommend for your neighborhood, um, and what type of wildlife live there so that you know what wildlife to support and, and to advocate for and how to kind of be part of that discovery by using apps called Like iNaturalist, which is a, an app on your phone where you can take photos of wildlife around your neighborhood and share that with scientists. And that data informs policy. And so I think that that is a way for people to contribute um, and really help out animals through community science is just gathering information that is in inaccessible because most of these cities are, are all private property. And so it's hard to kind of get a sense of a comprehensive idea of what's in that ecosystem because a lot of it's inaccessible. And so by people sharing their own information from their own properties, it really fills in these important data gaps. Well, thank you. You answered my question and then some. <laughs> Allison, I will leave it to you to close. What a beautiful and inspiring story and experience. And just a reminder of how much representation matters. And so grateful that you're in this space and welcoming in and including generations to follow. This will be, the recording will be available on Maddie's Pet Forum. We'll be answering your questions there. Miguel, thank you so, so much. Um, for sharing this interconnectedness that exists between all of us. Have a great week, everyone. And reminder, no call next week. We'll see you the following week on the 10th. Thanks so much. Thank you.